part two of my video series on the history of KISS, where we last left off with the original four. Their final show was in F F Fresno, and KISS later went into the studio in 1980 to record their next album, Unmasked. However, Peter Chris did not play on this album, but used Anton Figg, just like they did on the album Dynasty. But, I, but Peter Chris did play on one song on the album, and that's the song Dirty Living. And Peter Chris did make one final appearance with Kiss during the whole Unmasked promotion, and that's for the music video Sh Sh Shandy. However, after that music video was finished, Peter Chris was fired. Then it was off to find a new drummer. And they would later turn focus to sober pairman Paul Calavera, who we all know him as Eric Carr. Then, once he got into the band, it was first order business was to get him a makeup character. The first makeup character they gave him was the Hawk. Even gave him uh, a costume for the Hawk, which Paul described him as Evil Big Bird. Um, which, as hilarious as that sounds, that whole character and costume idea was rejected. Um, there's a character, there's a picture of Eric Carr um, wearing the makeup uh, character of the Hawk, and he just does not look very happy. And the, the character that they went with and he stayed when is the fox. And that character is pretty cool. I like that. And Eric's first show with KISS in the Unmasked Tour was in New York City, KISS's hometown, or home state, as you were. Which is also Eric's home state also, because Eric Carr is from New York also. Which is pretty cool. And that's the only U.S. show that the Unmasked, Unmasked Tour um, had. The rest of the Unmasked Tour is in... Europe and the UK, and also in Australia, because Kiss has never been to Australia, for, and the first time they went to Australia was with Eric Carr, and it was dubbed uh, Kissteria when Kiss went to Australia. It was pretty cool, and Australia is the first you know time that I'm aware of. It's the second time that I'm aware of that Gene used the flying rig. The first time that he did it was with the original four at Largo in 79. And it was for the typical, you know, Gene going up. This time, however, in Sydney, um, Gene kind of was going straight across. So that was kind of cool. It was kind of interesting how they did it that way. So anyways, after the Unmasked tour was over, KISS went back to record their next studio album, Music from the Elder. And also, they really changed their look once again. Not just in costume wise, but they cut their hairs also. And the album was produced once again by Bob Ezrin. And the album was not well received by KISS fans. And we'll talk about what the uh, aftermath was at pretty soon. Um, the album did not have a tour. What KISS did was make several TV appearances on, you know, TV shows where they lip-synced the songs from The Elder. They actually did a live appearance on the show called The F F F Fridays, where they did The Oath, I, Lord of God Heroes. I know that's not the right order, but, you know, still. Um, they, did a TV a uh, they did a TV performance in Mexico, where they did um, Charisma and Ask Me For Loving You, which is pretty cool. But still, that whole elder look um, is not one of the looks I am a fan of for Kiss. I like Paul's 
look for Elder. Ace's look is pretty cool. Um, Eric's look is cool also. It's Gene's look that kind of, you know, turns me off on the whole thing, because uh, when I was getting the kiss, I've always liked Gene's costumes, and the Elder outfit for Gene was one that I could not get into for Gene. Like, you know, his shorter hair, um, that costume that he was wearing was just not something that I cared for. And plus, after Kiss made the Elder album, Ace wanted out of the band. Because originally, after Kiss did Unmasked, Ace wanted Kiss to go back to the studio and make a hard rock album, which they didn't do. And... After the Elder was made, Ace just said, Fuck it, I want out. Paul basically had to beg Ace to come back and not leave Kiss. He drove, Paul drove up, up to Ace's house in Connecticut and basically spent the day with Ace to not leave. It didn't work. He, he left. But, it, he sort of left, but, you know, he stayed a little bit. Um, then came the album Creatures, which had Ace's face on the album cover, but he didn't play it, anything on that album. But Ace was with Kiss during the promoting of the album. So to make it seem like, you know, he's going to be involved with the tour, but by that point, you know, Ace, Ace was checked out. You know, he had this smile on his face, but, you know, Ace, Ace wanted out by this point. And they had a lot of studio guitar players on the album. Most notably, a guy by the name of Vincent Crisano, who uh, we all know him as Vinnie Vincent. And he'll become part of the story pretty soon. Like I said, Ace won it out. He stayed. Excuse me. He stayed during the promoting of the tour, a press conference. He did a music video for "I Love It Loud," but he left. Like I said, Paul basically begged him to not leave, but that didn't work. So he left. So once again, they were they were down a member, a member that they really didn't want to lose. So. It all came down when the tour was going to happen, they needed a member. So they took one of the studio musicians and took him for the tour. That guy being Vinny Vincent. And they needed a makeup character for him. And his character was pretty cool. Um, the Ankh Warrior. Now, Vinny Vincent's character. I like, like I said, and I thought Vinnie Vincent wrote some pretty cool songs on Creatures, had some good shows on the album, but we'll get to my thoughts on Vinnie Vincent pretty soon. Um, when it came time for the tour, Vinnie, Vinnie was, was the guy, and everyone kind of was confused because, you know, there were posters of Kiss with Ace Fraley, and when people were getting ready to see Kiss, there was there was another guy, not Ace. And it was kind of like, what the fuck? But, people didn't care because, you know, it's Kiss. But, the bear came, this along came with the biggest snag of all. Kiss was playing in the States, which was Eric Carr's first U.S. tour. But, Kiss was only playing to half full arenas. This is the aftermath of The Elder. Because Kiss made The Elder and people suddenly lost interest in what Kiss had. Um, so when Kiss started looking like themselves again, Gene finally looked like himself, Paul um, looked like himself, and they had like a pretty cool stage, you know, that drum with the tank centerpiece. 
Um, it didn't work, basically, because all that came out of it was them playing the half full arenas. Um, the most popular show that they had was when they went to Brazil and played to like a pretty packed stadium. Which was the very last show of the tour. But in the States, uh, nothing. And that's kind of what happens when you make one album back in the day, which would have been, which is, which was considered a dud, and you make basically the heaviest album that they've made, and then it's you go on tour for it, and this is kind of the aftermath of it. But I will say the tour was pretty cool. The, and there were some things that came out of it that, uh, that KISS did that, was, that are still being used now. Like, the Creatures tour was the first tour that Gene used the axe base for the blood spitting. Excuse me. Creatures tour was the first tour that Gene used the axe base on for blood spitting. Because... Because a few times... Gene used the Axe Base for like music videos, not for like an actual concert tour. And that Hell's Bell sound effect that he uses now, that was like the first tour he used it on, which is pretty cool. And Eric Carr's um, Tank Centerpiece, once again, that, that was pretty cool. I, I like that. So, um, basically the Creatures tour was, in Gene and Paul's eyes, it was sort of a letdown. In their own words, in, this later, in the recent documentary they did, because they had two new characters, the Fox and the Ankh Warrior, and no one was buying it. Which is the biggest load of bullshit um, that they've said. Um, I, I just told you that the reason that the Creatures Tour bombed is because Kiss may be elder, it fucked them over, and no one was really interested in Kiss anymore after the elder, and plus the makeup um, was running its course. People were losing interest with Kiss and the makeup. And so, They had one more show up with the tour, which was in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, which was the, the most popular show from that tour. It was also, and so compared to the U.S. shows for Kiss, this is pretty good, and that was it. Then Kiss did something that no one saw coming. And it pretty much saved their asses. They went on MTV and took off the makeup. And then the first album without makeup was Lick It Up. Still with Vinnie Vincent. But Vinnie Vincent did write some good songs with Creatures. And he wrote some really good songs on Lick It Up. Then came the tour, and the very first show without makeup was in Lisbon, Portugal. Excuse me again. Sorry about this. The first show without makeup was in Lisbon, Portugal, and everyone seemed to be, you know, really good at doing really well. Everyone except for Gene, and this is going to be like a recurring theme that I'm going to be talking about since we're in the, like, the non-makeup days of KISS. Um, Paul was managing really well, Eric was doing well, and Vinny, well, Vinny was being Vinny. And Gene, well, Gene was kind of lost, because he was still trying to be, you know, tough and menacing, and trying to be all of all the things that he was as the demon, just without the 
without the armor and the spikes and the dragon boots, which does not translate well without all that gear on. Um, the only thing that he that he did do that worked well was the fire breathing, which you can do fire breathing without makeup. The one thing that was rumored he tried to do without makeup was the blood spitting, which, um, if that's true, that that would look weird and ridiculous doing without makeup on. You have to be the demon to do blood spitting. You just can't be plain old Gene Simmons and not spew blood. If what he if he actually did it, try to attempt doing that. Um, he tried that. He also tried. What is no? What is a known fact is um, the first non-makeup tour, which was the Look It Up tour, he did try to still be that creepy demon, do that creepy demon move when he did the, with the bass solo, which is like, uh, well, that's, that's something. And, it just, it was kind of weird seeing Gene kind of be the demon when he was not wearing the demon outfits. It was pretty weird. And then came 84, still in the Look It Up tour. They were in Evansville, and that was the final show with Vinnie Benson because Vinnie Benson. He is good in the studio, but he is not well live. Like, he does a good job doing the solos for the songs that, you know, he wrote for Kiss Live. But when it comes to the songs that Ace does, um, no. He, he, he doesn't do Ace's... Like, I'm not expecting Vinny to, you know, duplicate Ace's solos note for note. I'm expecting him to do his own thing, but when his own thing is, you know, not very good... Uh, you know, it is what it is. But I think the one thing that, you know, Paul and Gene were upset about with Vinny because, like, Vinny takes way too long with his guitar solos. So, Evansville was the final performance that Vinny Vincent had with Kiss, and after that, Vinny was fired. So, later in 84, they were once again without a guitar player, and they hired uh, Mark St. John, who was very short-lived. He did one album with Kiss called Animal Eyes, and, and they had a pretty big hit with Heavens on Fire. And Mark was part of the tour for a, a little bit, the one show that everyone knows that Mark St. John was a part of is the Baltimore show. Then, then Mark just kind of uh, went out of commission because his hand just kind of crapped out on him. Then, yet again, they were without another guitar player, which is sad because I've actually heard Mark St. John live with Kiss through audio, and it's... He's actually pretty good with Kiss. He would have made a good fit, but uh, Bruce got the call because Bob was trying to get Bruce in, in with Kiss, and he uh, got the gig, and Bruce helped him out for the rest of the Animalized tour, and it was pretty good. And later, in 85... They made Asylum. Then for the Asylum tour, it had the stupidest look I have ever seen out of Kiss. Um, it was 80s in the worst way possible. But Paul, Eric, and Bruce, especially Paul, Paul just went up on stage and pulled it off no problem. Gene... Uh, Gene, however, once again, looked hopelessly lost, 
still trying to do, you know, demon things, sticking out his tongue, trying to be tough and menacing. Well, sorry, you can't be tough and menacing while looking like the most hideous girl on earth. It just doesn't work that way. And also during the asylum tour, they had like this oversized KISS logo, and that was pretty cool. Um, it was also pretty bizarre, while Gene's bass solo during the asylum tour, he took a page out of Ace's book and started shooting, shooting rockets out of his bass. I was like, okay, uh, Gene, why are you suddenly doing Ace stuff? This is how lost Gene was becoming. And also, speaking about Gene in the 80s, Gene decided to fuck off from KISS and decided to take into acting. So, he was writing m music for KISS, but he wasn't heavily involved in KISS like he was maybe back in the 70s, which, you know, it pissed Paul off. But, I would say, you know, he, might, he may not have been, you know, as involved, but he still wrote in a few good songs. I would say, like, the one song that he wrote that I wasn't a fan of, off of Animal Eyes, was Burn, Bitch, Burn. Now, back to Asylum, he wrote, he wrote some pretty good songs, like Trial by Fire. That's, that's one of my favorite songs that he wrote off of Asylum. And their look is just, eh, not my thing. Then, also around that time period, I don't know for certain when this came out, Kiss put out a home video release called Kiss Exposed, which basically is a bunch of music videos and live clips put together in in a weird uh, documentary interview type of way, but it's nothing but a bunch of 80s cheesiness in a really good way. It, it's pretty cool. I enjoy it. And what's pretty cool about it is um, the fact that uh, the interviewer goes to some um, <clears throat> mansion and that all the members of KISS live there, which is totally not true. And uh, the doorbell is Rock and Roll All Night, which is basically how the promo music video for Exposed starts off with, with the live version of Rock and Roll All Night, which is pretty cool, I must say. Anyways, the Asylum Tour takes them into 86, and, you know, As much as I've seen that look, I mean, that look is, is still whatever to me, but, you know, Paul pulls it off pretty easy. I think Paul was the only one to pull off a lot of their uh, not-so-great non-makeup looks, while Gene just looked hopelessly confused. Um, another thing I, must, I will say about the Asylum Tour, um... They did add a uh, Doctor Love in one in the in the show and the Baltimore show of eighty five. Um, I'm not sure if any other shows that song got added to, but um, if it, if it did, I'm not really sure. Anyways, um, into eighty seven, where Kiss released uh, Crazy Nights. I kind of hit miss album to a lot of to a lot of people. Um, me, I kind of think the album's okay, but some songs I, I uh, go back and I went back and forth on for the time being, and now it's kind of like it's okay. Um, this is kind of like has some songs where they do kind of you know copycat each other. And, you know, I will say, you know, Kiss 
improved their look since the Asylum Tour. But I will say, um, the songs that do repeat themselves are Bang Bang You and No No No, which, uh, they might be copying off of Crazy Nights, but those songs are still pretty cool. Um, I didn't like them at first, but uh, now they're like, they're whatever. The songs that I really like from Gene, besides No No No, is Hell or High Water and Good Girl Gone Bad. Those are really cool songs from Gene. Once again, even though he was, you know, dipping out of Kiss and doing acting, um, he still was making decent songs. They may not have been, you know, as good as, you know, what he used to have been making, but, you know, we'll get back to, you know, Gene making, you know, kick-ass songs pretty soon. So, the Crazy Nights Tour, um, in the early days of the Crazy Nights Tour, Kiss added, um, Hell or High Water and When Your Walls Come Down pretty early into the set list, which I really honestly wish they could have kept those two songs in the, t in, in, in the tour set list. Would have given it more variety um, from the album, but, you know, they didn't, so uh, all that was left in the later part of the tour in 88 was Crazy Nights, Bang Bang You, and No 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 and Reason to Live, which, that's not terrible. Um, they did add um, Dr. Love and I'm uh, loving you, but that's in the Japan part of the tour. Um, they did play um, in New York, like at the Ritz, which is pretty cool. And when they did go to Japan, like I said, they did do Dr. Love and Out Here for Loving You, but out Here for Loving You was added like in the UK and European half of the tour also, so that song was already added way way before they went to Japan. So it was kind of cool to hear that song get added. And what was cool was also Paul's voice, like Paul's voice was starting to hit like insanely high notes, so that was that was pretty cool. Like, um, yeah, like Paul's voice was starting to hit like some insane high notes, which was pretty cool. So after the Crazy Nights tour um, came. Uh, 1989, which came two things. And I'm not exactly sure which one of them came first, so I'm going to do it in the order I think it happened. The first thing was Hot Machine, which was their last album of the 80s. And it was the first one that was like a pretty long one, like 15 songs on a, a CD. And That one is is pretty good. Um, it does have a, a few duds in it, like uh, "Loves a Slap in the Face," "Read My Body," you know, uh, "Forever," which you know, I know "Forever" is a pretty popular song, but it's this one, but I just can't get into. It. The ones I do like is uh, "Betrayed," "Silver Spoon." You Love Me to Hate You, King of Hearts, um, but those are pretty good. Um, Somewhere Between Heaven and Hell, like, all those songs are pretty good. I mean, and we'll talk about the tour later, but first I want to talk about the 1989 Paul Stanley Club Tour. Um, Paul was taking a break from Kiss and did his... 1989 club tour. We got like a, a solo band and was performing basically Paul Stanley songs from Kiss and uh, 
basically solo album songs. He got Eric Singer, who would become important to the story later. He got Bob Hewlett, who um, performed on the studio side of Alive 2, this 78 solo album, and Killers, which I'll which I haven't mentioned, mostly due to accident, and I got a lot of things on my mind already. And it, it's pretty cool. Um, that whole club tour is pretty cool. Like, he played a lot of songs that, you know, were pretty cool. And also, he would, they played Let's Put the X in Sex, a song off of Smashes. And uh, he also was promoting a song, that, a, a new Kiss song, called Hide Your Heart. Which that alone was pretty cool, you know, that Paul Stanley, on a solo tour, was promoting a new Kiss song. I kind of find that pretty cool. Uh, however, um, Eric Carr... Um, no, went to one of these club shows and saw Eric Singer drum for Paul Stanley and it is said by Paul Stanley in his book that um, Eric Carr went to Eric Singer and said um, you're going to take my place um, I'm not exactly sure why Eric Carr would say that maybe he felt threatened that you know Paul would choose Eric Singer to be the next drummer over him, you know. Whatever the case may be, that whole thing's not important right now, at least. Because at this moment in time, Eric Carr was still the Kiss drummer. And if you ask me, he's, he's a fucking good Kiss drummer. Alright, so then came the Hot Mache Tour. And Gene's look for the Hot Mache Tour um, was actually pretty good. Um, he had like a leather jacket on, he had a kiss shirt underneath, he had some cowboy boots. Um, that was like one of the first times I thought, you know, Gene was starting to look more like Gene, at least not in makeup. Like, he was starting to look, you know, presentable. Um, Paul, Paul was, you know, Paul was being, you know, typical Paul Stanley about makeup. He came on stage with one of those, you know, flashy shirts that looked like, you know, it was a leftover from the Asylum tour. But anyways, um, the tour was fucking awesome. I mean, they had one of the coolest non-makeup stage pieces ever. Um, Leon Sphinx. Um, not only was the stage piece awesome, but the set list was awesome. They brought back so many of the 70s classics, and a lot, they also brought in some of their hidden gems from the 80s, which, sadly, one of them got axed, which... It's kind of a bummer. One of the songs that they did play from the, from the tour that did get axed was Under the Gun, which is a, it's kind of a shame that Under the Gun got axed, but, you know, it is what it is. And in its place, I guess, they made room for I Was Made For Loving You. That's later on in the tour, but still, I mean, I thought they were, they were sounding good, but the tour, was, the set list was good, both versions. The state piece was cool because, you know, lasers, lasers were coming out of it, like bombs and all that thing, but there was one thing missing. There was no KISS logo. Or so everyone thought at the time, because, you know, everyone was there, but there, there was no KISS logo. But, when, you know, I Want You started, 
then they revealed, you know, their KISS logo, and everyone lost it, because, you know, for the rest of the concert that everyone went to, there was no logo. But the second I Want You started, KISS revealed their logo, and that's when everyone lost it, which is pretty cool if you ask me. But, sadly, as cool as this tour is, there is a bit of sad news to this, because this is the last tour with Eric Carr, because, uh, the last show with Eric Carr on the Hot Mache tour was in New York City at Madison Square Garden, because, uh, they, Eric Carr said that, um, I guess to Paul or whoever, saying, you know, he went to the doctors and they found something on his heart. Well, um, it turned out to be cancer. And he had to go to the hospital. He was hospitalized. Gene and Paul visited him. Eric Carr was, uh, was very hopeful thinking, you know, that he would get healthy enough to, to, to go back and be with the band. However, that wasn't to be the case. Um, because in 1991, Eric Carr died. And that kind of broke everyone. It broke Paul, it broke, uh, it broke Gene, it broke, uh, it broke a lot of people, but, um, but the, but Bruce said, you know, uh, the, the thing that I find the most, the thing I do the most during a time like this is getting back to work, or something to that effect, so, uh, Kiss went back into the studio and uh, and recorded their next album. And that is where I will leave part two at. I hope you guys enjoyed part two. Tune in next time for part three. <laughs>